it's time for another episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special, <clears throat> excuse me, today, my special guest is my friend, Phil Urena, and we're going to be discussing his new book, Redefining Grace, Living by His Presence and Moving in His Power. Phil, it is always an honor, my friend. Welcome back to the show. Good to be back, Sean. You know, you know how I feel about you. I love you, man. Well, good, good. It's better to uh, rather be your friend than be your enemy. So I, I will gladly receive that. Uh, it's been a few months since we've talked. Uh, I always have new people following the show, subscribing to the podcast. So uh, let's have you just give a little bit to kind of the elevator pitch version of the Phil Urena origin story for the people encountering you for the first time today. What are a few things they absolutely need to know about you? Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm Hispanic descent. I grew up on Long Island, about 30 minutes from New York City. I gave my life to the Lord in 1982. I'm an old guy. I was 27 at that time. Um, got into ministry three years later, well, actually a little less than three years. Um, within serving in the church, I've done almost everything you could think of. I was a I planted a house church. That was my first ministry. I ended up becoming, uh, joining the Vineyard Movement. I was uh, in the Vineyard, a youth pastor. Actually, I believe the first youth pastor on the East Coast. I was a worship pastor. I was a Sunday school director. I was an associate pastor, a church planter, senior. So pretty much everything that you could do in a church, I did. I've been doing itinerant ministry and, and leading uh, church for the last eight years now, a little over eight years and um, I started a new ministry three years ago called Kingdom Convergence, which is a ministry that I'm passionate for. It it's, starts with the calling of God in my life in 86 uh, into ministry. It's a bridge building ministry uh, to cross build relational bridges between denominations and streams and to equip in ministry and leadership to play together in various capacities, whether it's worship meetings or prayer, or and it's a calling to the East Coast to prepare the body of Christ in the East Coast for what I believe is coming, uh, a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I hope that's elevator enough. That is elevator enough, though, although I'm going to pull on another thread just because I can, because I'm the, I'm the host. Um, I know in, in terms of your house church days, your early call into ministry, if you will, it was a bit unorthodox. You weren't having like the standard church experience. Tell, tell us a bit yeah. about uh, those early days when you were figuring out what it meant to be doing ministry or even hosting a Bible study. Yeah, well, it, it was kind of like, well, first of all, I was an entrepreneur. I owned a, a successful business, small business, but made a lot, a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> you know, the equivalent of close to probably half a million by today's standards a year. I was living a, a lifestyle of being carefree in terms of finances, but still very grounded. And, um, you know, the Lord one night while I was closing up my shop, um, spoke to me and said, I want you to start a Bible study. And at that point, I didn't know any Christians. I was walking with him. I was a student of the word. I was, a, I'm a, you know, I'm a reader, you know, I was doing all that stuff, but I didn't know any believers. So I argued with him. I said, no, I can't start a Bible study. Nobody's going to come. I don't know any Christians. And he kind of, you know, our relationship, my relationship with the Lord is beautiful. And he's so patient and kind with me that he just kept nudging me, like, you know, annoying me with this, this thing, you know? So I said, okay, I'm going to do it, but nobody's going to come. That, that was kind of my fine. I'll do it, but you're going to see nobody's going to come. So after a year, you know, we, we had like five or six, actually we're probably about eight people. And then I had an encounter with the Holy spirit and actually um, the, the encounter I had launched us into about six months of renewal that grew us from these nine people where we probably led 40 people to the Lord in a matter of three or four months, not even knowing what we're doing, not even trying, not organizing, you know, outreach just through, as we went, we saw all sorts of miracles. But the thing that really I want to point out to is the Lord had an encounter with me one night when I was kind of frustrated and broken and feeling like a failure as a, as a Bible teacher or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and I just, I was, I was still smoking pot and I went outside in frustration and, and I complained and I said, and I'm still doing this. How can you put up with me? And he said, when you know how much I love you, 
you won't need that anymore. And I was immediately free from that. And that was my first encounter and understanding of the grace of God, you know, at that level. And then he launched us into this crazy season where we saw backs straightened out, a person with three days left to live with cancer, her eyes were completely yellow, um, her skin was, was purple, right before her eyes, color come back to her eyes, color come back to her skin, completely cancer free. We saw all sorts of things like that. And like I said, we probably led 30 or 40 people to the, to the Lord without even trying. Um, and then became too big for my home. And I asked the Lord, what do you want to do with this? Am I supposed to plant the church? I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm still running my business or trying to, um, though it was waning at that time because my passions were shifting. And that's when he actually led me. He says, no, I want you to get trained to be a church planter. And that's when I joined the Vineyard Movement at its, at its early stages, you know, uh, like four or five years old. And, I, and here I am. And Phil, in, in terms of if, if we say from that moment in your yard when you're kind of complaining with, arguing with God, where you got, got kind of the, that first download or glimpse of a, a beginning of an understanding of maybe the depth of God's grace, if you will, uh, through the years as it's kind of percolated and as God's been preparing you for what would eventually become the message that's in this book, um, was it a mix of your own experiences and how you saw God's grace working in other people's lives or uh, what were some of the things, maybe the high points that gave you concrete examples of what God's grace really looks like? Well, I probably would have to start um, with me questioning the definition that I kept hearing about grace, you know, God's un undeserved mercies, right? Because that wasn't my experience that night. Like nowhere in that experience did God communicate, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, like, relationally that wasn't there and and i accepted the definition um you know of that that we corporately have received for so many years and just kind of accepted it and and um and then what happened was i started listening to john wimmer's teaching on the gracelets of god and the word charisma or charis within that context which is grace and that started to stir some stuff in me and then kind of got busy in ministry, planting churches, doing things. And then around 15 years ago, um, as I was starting to develop my identity material, which became my book, The Father's Intention, I developed that um, because I was starting to do um, seminars and travel doing teaching on identity. <clears throat> and I started to, to kind of have this context of redefining grace. And, you know, how was I redefining it? And, and that process kind of caused me to do some research and, and scholarly research looking at early church and, and looking at the lives of people that I ran into that had just, you know, radical salvations, um, you know, likened to mine and even more radical and recognize that nowhere in their encounter with God did God communicate, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then I, I actually, what happened was I was asked to be part of a local Catholic college, interestingly enough, to work with their Christian group. And I asked the question, are you a saint or a sinner? If, if you're giving your life to the Lord, are you a saint or a sinner? And half of them were afraid to answer it because they didn't know. And then a few were like kind of answered, but there was one PK, one pastor's kid. Oh, you know, we're sinners. We're sinners saved by grace. I said, okay, so you see yourself still as a sinner. And he said, absolutely. I said, you understand that when you put I am in something, you're talking about an identity. He goes, yeah. I said, okay, so I want you over the next week to go look at scripture and see where there's an identity spoken to the redeemed, to those that have been restored that defines them as present term sinners. And he came back and he couldn't. I said, yeah, everything's past tense. I was, I was, I was. And we start, so I started to realize, okay, this is something that needs to be worked through and processed through. But I didn't think I was the guy to do it. You know, I'm not a scholar. And I thought this topic needs to be done in a scholarly way. And um, I just kind of put it in my, my itinerant ministry, bringing the, the ideas up that I was working through and sharing it in the context of identity. 
And, uh, but it came to the point where I realized I, I need to do something about this because I went, I went to a conference. I was staying with pastor friends of mine that were integral in my learning about leadership in, when I first came to the Lord. Amazing couple. And she just could not, when I was sharing this idea that the definition of, of unmerited favor, underserved, I didn't think was, was actually the biblical message. She just couldn't get it. She got angry. She got, and I thought, Lord, there's, there's a bondage to something here that's keeping people from fully understanding who you are and who they are around this particular theology. And I, I knew at that point I need to do something, but it took me about a decade to actually do it. Uh, in the book, Phil, you cover uh, kind of concepts or examples of grace from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, if you had to pick kind of a, a favorite account or story that really drives home or illustrates your definition of grace, where would we find that in the Bible? Gosh, there's so many of them, you know, that I can think of, but I'm probably going to gravitate to David for a couple of reasons. I think it, it models the fragility of a man who still wrestles with his sin nature, you know, and yet God's response to him, because I don't think grace and the kindness of God means that we don't have to be accountable for choices or be, bear with the ramifications. I think grace has more to do with the way God relates and, and created us to have relationship with, because I don't see grace only as something God gives, especially in the New Testament context. I see it as more than that, which I'll, I'll unwrap in a, in a little bit. So I think David, just the fact that he was a real person that, I mean, let's face it, some of the worst sins you could possibly imagine doing, David did, and yet he was a man from God's own heart because he was a man that was honest with God and authentic with God and transparent with God. And because of that, God's heart was moved to give him and extend to him a grace. And it wasn't because he didn't deserve it. That's not how God thinks. It's because of the heart to move towards God that moves God's heart towards us. And, um, and, and it, and gives us the framework and the positioning to receive grace. But I also think what we think grace is, is different. I unwrap that in the book as well. Um, and so I guess a, a follow-up question to that might be, uh, in terms of grace in the New Testament, Jesus comes on the scene, the Holy Spirit comes to empower the church. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does grace shift post-Pentecost? Okay, so that's where we really gain the understanding of God's intention from the garden. You know, the, the tree of life was really a tree of grace. So what I started to do is as I started to read the scripture um, and unwrapping and looking at the scripture and looking at the, the places where grace was, was written in, I started to realize that there was a life source issue that was there. Uh, and a good friend of mine, Josh Hoppings, um, encouraged me to do some studying into Irenaeus and the writings of Irenaeus on grace. Um, he, Irenaeus, for those that don't know who he is, he's basically the spiritual grandson of John the Apostle, John the Beloved. He was, uh, Polycarp was his mentor. And so you, you have to figure he's the earliest writer that we can take hold of with some of the theology that we wrestle with, in particular around their view of grace and actually salvation even, and the fall. And as I started to read his stuff, I was like, wow, this is radically different than the perspective taught in the Western church. And then I started to look at the history and see the, the influence of Augustine and, and where Augustine came from and how that influenced Calvin and others. Because interestingly enough, Irenaeus's perspective was that in the garden when we fell, I want to say this in a way that people don't think I'm crazy or a heretic, but his perspective was that, that the fall, that God had created things in such a way because of the desire for free will, that the fall in his eyes was one necessary path. Like not, in other words, God didn't intend for the fall, 
but they didn't even call it, they didn't use the language of the fall. That came later. He saw it as God wanting to mature people, mature a family, to be able to have encounter with him, and that they could do it one of two ways, but ultimately we were going to get to the same place. One would have been a lot easier, a lot less painful, but but his grace was in both, both uh, routes. And as he started to unwrap grace, I realized that idea of unmerited favor was not there, that, that the concept was more about grace is the life of the spirit and living in relation with the spirit life in, within us, which means in us by the Holy Spirit, there's a fountain of grace that has absolutely nothing to do with, with merit it, and is totally about relationship and being born again and being vessels of grace. So, you know, as I started to look at it, I was like, wow, this is too important um, not to somehow put together, though I felt really um, not the guy to do it. You know, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a theologian. Although my friends keep telling me I need to stop that because I think theologically. But I thought, surely there's got to be somebody with, with letters after his name that would be more deserving of covering this topic. Um, but, but the Lord kind of pushed me through the warfare that was, it was the, this is the hardest thing I've ever written in my life. Um, it took me literally 10 days of dealing with emotional attack, you know, thoughts and just all sorts of stuff to even get it beginning of it going. But once I got the breakthrough, it started to flow. And, and I'm thankful for friends that partnered with me that are smarter than I am and kind of gave me guidance where to go to substantiate the things that I was felt, felt like I was seeing in Scripture and that Lord was intimating to me. I, I feel like the distinction you're drawing there between, you know, that idea of if, if grace is unmerited favor, um, you know, that's almost something where maybe I'm positionally able to access that grace. Um, I can understand the definition of that grace in my head, but in mm-hmm. terms of really internalizing it in my heart and in my spirit and having that uh, wellspring of living water, that grace that's flowing out of me, so to speak, um, I, I feel like those are maybe kind of two different journeys. If I, if I look at my own journey coming out of a, a Lutheran background, marrying a Baptist girl and, and being part of the Baptist church before <laughs> moving into the spirit empowered side of the church, there was a lot early on in my journey that I knew in my head and it sort of touched the top of my heart, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't until I got radically baptized by the Holy spirit at a voice of the apostles event that everything else began to make sense and that I could actually understand God's grace and favor how much he loved me in a way that was impossible when it was just here. And there was a, there was a gap between here and here. So I, I feel like at least my own journey, I couldn't understand the depth of God's grace or love for me until uh, the spirit got activated in, in uh, just a major way. Yeah. Well, I think, I think for me, the issue is this. As, as I started to, to really understand the kindness of God in my own life and how he led me for the first four years all by myself, not part of a church, nobody to mentor me, just through relationship and stuff. My theology is, has shifted a bit since 1982 and 83, but not really a whole lot. My core theology is I, I was a kingdom of God person then, even though I didn't know that there was such a thing. And, um, but I think this is the issue for me on a pastoral level. So being one that also cares about people and cares for people is that that other, when we start to, and I unwrap this in the book pretty clearly, but when we look at the word, like words mean something. And words can communicate something that begins to influence how we see ourselves and how we see God. So when we add to the definition, which, by the way, nowhere, nowhere in the definition of grace in the Greek language, charis, or anywhere else, is the idea of unmerited favor there. The idea is a gift of favor, not unmerited. So when we add unmerited to it, what happens is our eyes leave the goodness of God and focus in on our own brokenness. And that becomes a barrier for us to have encounter. It causes religious, um, religious cycles of trying to fix ourselves, trying to be good enough, all of that. And I watch that pastorally as a result of that understanding. I watch people not able to get free 
and and be able to rest in the love of God and and mature and actually find their place in in the kingdom and be healthy. What we tended to do is put more and more religious walls and really, you know, you have to perform a certain way and those things. And that all comes, in my opinion, my humble opinion, it all comes from an understanding that we don't deserve this. So in my journey, I wanted to see where does God communicate that we don't deserve it? And everybody points to Paul's letters and particular things that we were saved by grace when we were yet sinners. But all that's past context. Paul nowhere says, you don't deserve this. What he's saying, we can't earn this. There's a distinct difference between deserving and earning. You can't earn any gift. You know, if, it, if you have to earn it, it's not a gift. It's payment. So when I started to unwrap that, I said, okay, so this concept of unmerited favor, first of all, it's not in the definitions of, it wasn't in the early church, and it tends to communicate a sense of, of diminishing who we are as sons and daughters and focuses on our own brokenness instead of focusing on the goodness and the glory and the kindness of God. And, and I was so happily surprised to discover that the church in the first couple of hundred years did not see it the way we see it. And in, in terms of when we get a proper I don't even know if I want to say understanding because I'm, I'm making it like sound like it's something logical that we're thinking about. But when we're, our identity shifts, we're in proper relationship uh, operating in the fullness, I guess, of, of God's grace. Once, once we're in that place, how does that shift our ability as we minister to others, as we're um, operating in the kingdom? Once grace gets right side, right sided or right size in our life, how does that affect our ability to, minister to be Jesus to the world? What, what's the shift that's possible there? Oh, I think there's a, the major shift is that we t- because in our brokenness, we always are looking for approval and validation in place, right? We, we in shame, shame is self-hate. That's what shame is. So when we're thinking we're always not deserving, it, it kind of supports the shame identity that, that we're not good enough. God doesn't communicate that way with his sons and daughters. So when that shifts, a couple of things happens. First of all, you're able to rest in his love more fully. And when you can rest in his love, you don't strive anymore. And when you're not striving and you kind of start to take hold of who you are and you know that you're in process and that's okay because he's working in us to make us like Jesus, you know, and that's not something we can make happen. It's something that is a byproduct of intimacy and, you know, being connected with the vine then you can start to rest. And as you start to do that, you're able to deal with shame issues much more easily, able to own it, work through it, let the emotion flow, let the pain and grief flow. And as that starts to happen, you start to gain a Christ confidence, not a confidence in your ability, but a confidence in the relationship. And you start to realize that the mission that you're assigned to and in our case, as, as charismatics, the capacity to move in the gifts of the Spirit are no longer based on, on you being good enough or holy enough or religious enough. It's based on the fact that you're a son and daughter of God. He loves you, and he's actually created you for this. This is the life of the Holy Spirit that should naturally flow out of us. When people get healed in my ministry, that's not me doing it. I'm just the, the bridge that allows for the life of the spirit that's in me to flow and touch another life. That's grace. That's grace in action. So so grace becomes the life of the Holy Spirit working in us, for us, and through us. So we walk in this beautiful partnership uh, as family, and we release the life of, of God. You know, that grace is the active working life of God in us, you know, relationally. It's where where Jesus is on the way, the truth, and the life. Those things are connected. So the gracelets, the gifts of, of the Holy Spirit, they're just different expressions of God's life moving through us, the grace of God moving through us. Phil, if you could talk to that younger version of yourself who was mm-hmm. in your yard wrestling with God, starting to understand uh, just that beginning inklings of what God's grace meant. Uh, what, what, what would you communicate to that, that younger version of yourself about 
maybe what you've learned on this side of the journey? Um, probably this, and it wouldn't be a lot different than what happened then, but probably this, the revelation of his love is even bigger than what you just experienced. And it's even more intimate and you can't lose it. As long as you keep your eyes on him, as long as you stay connected with him, you can't lose it. Because literally at that moment, I was changed in that moment forever because I expected I don't deserve this. I will be punished. And what I got is you don't understand how much I love you. So I would just say to that young guy, you're right. Don't stop pursuing the love, the intimacy, because you're on course. And don't worry about probably with some of the things I walked through, I would probably say, don't allow man to steal this from you. Because this is what it's all about. It's not about all those other things. It's not about ministry. And in terms of the reader's journey with redefining grace, when they get to that last page, uh, is it some of those same things you hope every reader captures, takes away from the book or is, uh, is what you'd like them to grasp maybe a little bit different? Well, I mean, there's so many things I go into the book. I really cram quite a bit in there. There's history in there. There's theology in there. I talk about predestination and free will and that it's not either or, that they can actually work together in Christ. And at the end, the only supernatural stories I give are to, are to demonstrate free will and predestination, how they can work together. Um, which I don't want to, I don't want to share because they're, they're crazy stories. And I mean, I think they're crazy stories, but, um, crazy, beautiful stories, but still um, probably that what I would desire for a reader to, to, to get from this is for them to understand that a, there's a freedom in the flow of God's love. You, listen, this is, this is what I tell people. You can't take truth light or the way love and somehow separate them from life where you get the others, you get the other. Does that make sense? So in other words, you can't walk in love. You can't walk in truth and not carry the life of Jesus Christ, the life of the spirit. So kind of like, Hey, love yourself. Take a step back. Don't beat yourself up. Be honest with yourself. You know, I, I heard someone, I was at a meeting, a large conference where Todd White was. Um, I've met Todd a couple of times. We're not friends. He made a statement that offended people. And the statement was, is that I don't sin. Now they were like, who is he to say they don't, and he doesn't sin. What is, he wasn't saying he doesn't wrestle with sin. There's a distinct difference. He's saying, I just choose not to sin. Well, to me, why is that a problem? Shouldn't we all want to live that life? And I think the way you live that life is in intimacy with God and giving the Holy Spirit's life in you, complete freedom, and, and saying no to things, saying no to things that would cause you to sin. And I think we're all, we all can have that because it's the gift of God. So that's, that would be one of the things that I would hope they'd come out of after is that they would have an, have an understanding that the life of the Spirit is grace working in you. It's not something that you do. It's not even something that God just gives you. He gave it to you. You've got it all. If you've got the Holy Spirit, you get all the grace you ever need for anything. And, and just take the pressure off. Stop striving so much. You know, don't be afraid to look at yourself and your brokenness and let God love you in that place and let him transform you. And then go change the world where you live. Go touch lives where you, where you live as you go. That, that's, I hope that's what people get out of it. And Phil, before we go, would you take a few moments to pray for the viewers, the listeners who are with us right now? Absolutely. So, Lord, I'm just thankful for Sean and the platform to be able to um, have people share their hearts and, uh, and share their journeys. I think those are really important things, God, because they connect us as we share. You know, the word testimony in Hebrew, eduth, means do it again. So, Lord, I pray that the journey you've brought me on, whatever is good in it, whatever has been pure in it, whatever has been been prosperous in my soul, that, that you, Lord God, would release that in the lives of the people that might read this book and also the people that Sean connects to, Lord, that you would bring us into a place of greater freedom, greater understanding of the height, the width, the depth, the breadth of your love together as your family. 
And Lord, I pray that you would release right now your glory in such a way on your people that the life and the love of the Holy Spirit that is the active gift of grace in us would shine into the darkness through our lives, God, and reveal who you are in such a compelling way through the demonstration of the Spirit's power, through the words that we speak, through the things that we touch, how well we love, and that it would completely turn upside down this generation for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Phil. And Phil, for the listeners, the viewers who would like to connect with you, find out more about your ministry, find out more about your book, where can we connect with you on the web? Okay, go to www.kingdomconvergence.com. We do a lot of things at Kingdom Convergence. There's stuff there for everybody. Um, We're just getting our bookstore and our resource store up online. But um, yeah, www.kingdomconvergence.com. And on there, you'll see information about our school, Convergence School of Ministry, and some of the other things that we do. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Phil and pick up your very own copy of this new book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Phil Urena. Once again, our book today was Redefining Grace, Living by His Presence and Moving in His Power. And again, if you'd like to find out more about Phil and his ministry and his books, head on over to kingdomconvergence.com. And Phil, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been a pleasure and a joy to have you back on the show. My pleasure, my friend. 